So uh, we made it. Well, we decided to read liturgy, the spirit of the liturgy, because uh, we thought it was timely in the effort that the whole country is doing in this Eucharistic revival. That we would choose to read something that would help us grow in an understanding of the liturgy and of the Mass. So that's why we chose um, this book. I still want to remind all of you that the essence of the Catholic Advance Movement is sharing the vocation to holiness. That's why Catholic Advance exists, so that each member could be more aware and more convicted that uh, he's been called to holiness the day he was baptized and that it's worth sharing this vocation. So in the context of our call to holiness, and in the context of the general invitation of the nation to grow in our Eucharistic appreciation and understanding and uh, devotion, we're choosing to read this book. I said last week, and I guess I'll, I'll insist on this, I know that this book is not easy, and I think this chapter was especially uh, demanding and challenging and perhaps abstract. But hopefully that's why we meet today, right? So we can break it down a little bit. But let us not let us not lose the horizon of why we're here. And the only reason why we're here, the only reason why Catholic Advance exists, is to move its members to be more convicted that they are meant to be saints. And being a saint obviously also includes living fully the sacraments and the mystery of, of, of the sacraments in the church. So last week we spoke about three things, right? We spoke first about the title, The Spirit of the Liturgy. And we mentioned that this title was inspired in a book previously written by a German author of Tuba with a Italian name. Who remembers the name of the original author of The Spirit of the Litur Liturgy? That was published Oh, it's there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Romano Guardini, right? And he published this book back in during the times of the First World, World, World War. And he published this book because he understood that the liturgy of the church was like a painting covered with many layers. And he wanted to make these layers, like the beauty of the painting, available again to Catholics. And when Ratzinger writes his own book 80 years later, He's writing in a very different context, after Vatican II, but with the same purpose, to help Catholics rediscover the beauty of the liturgy. We also spoke about how, so the second point is, we went through the narration of the book of Exodus and how Moses came up to the Pharaoh and he said, you gotta let us go. We, you gotta let us go because we have to worship in the desert. And the Pharaoh was a little bit reluctant, they were negotiating, going back and forth. But finally, Moses leaves with his people, and not three days into the desert, but three months into the desert, he goes into the mountain and he receives two things. Do you remember exactly what does he receive in the mountain? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments and what else? Instructions on Yes. So the insight that Rasinger offered us is that when they went into the desert, they truly found the way that God wanted to be worshipped. And the way that God wanted to be worshipped is through the life of the old. Of, of his own people, right? A life, a life led and guided by the commandments of God. Though the cult was also important because Ratzinger made the point that only when you look at God in the cult, you can truly live according to what he wants for your life. And the last point we, we made last week, we talked about the golden calf, you remember? And how the golden calf wasn't that they were praising and external God, but they were just making a worship according to their own needs, right? And we spoke about how in the Catholic Church maybe that also happened, a call that wanted to just satisfy their own desires. So I think that today we're going to discuss the most difficult chapter, and the chapter is titled Liturgy, Cosmos, History. And it's, if you think about it, cosmos and history is space and time. Cosmos is space, history is time. 
So this is as abstract as you can get. And I think that after this chapter, it's going to be a little bit more down to earth. But I still believe that this chapter can offer us a lot of practical insights. So I'm still going to try to draw three teachings or three, like, three theological things that I want to share with you and we see how we bring this to our own life. Okay? So I really like how he starts this chapter and he starts making a distinction between the way that the, the natural religions worship and the way that the uh, revealed religions worship. So what are the natural religions, right? For example, I don't know, if you go to Peru, the Incas had their own form of natural religion. They had their own gods, and the gods are, in a way, confused with nature itself, right? I suspect that if you analyze also the worship of the Native Americans, it's also a natural religion where the worship has to do with nature and the gods. And on the other hand, he says, there's also the worship of the, of the religions that come from Revelation. So he says, this distinction has been made. The cult of the natural religions is a cult related with cosmos. And he says, but the cult of the revealed religions is a cult that has to do with history. What does this mean? I'm going to explain it to you. Okay? Think about Christianity. Think about our own faith. Or think about the faith of the Jews. We are a revealed religion. We believe that God has revealed to us His own life and His own plan for us. So how do we, how do we worship? We worship celebrating what God has done for us in history. We celebrate basically the fact that God made himself man in time and he saved us. So what we do is we remember what God has done in time to save us. So what's the center of our cult? The Paschal Mystery. The faith that Christ came into time 2,000 years ago and he died for us. So in, in a sense, it makes, you know, we look at history and we make, and this is the key term. We make a memorial of what has happened in history. We celebrate what God has done for us in the past. But it is not only that we celebrate what happened in the past, it's not like we only commemorate but we know that when we met, when we do, when we celebrate the memorial, salvation comes back to us. We make ourselves contemporary with salvation. But it is us looking into history and saying, Lord, you have acted and you have saved us in time. So that's why memorial is the great concept of the re revealed religions. Let's think about the Jews. What's the central also celebration for the Jews? Their own, uh, their own uh, Easter, right? When they left from Egypt to the Promised Land. They also remember what God has done for them in time. Now, if you look at the cosmic religions, if you look at the religion, for example, of the Incas, they don't have a history where God has acted in favor of them. For example, there is a myth. So there's no history, there's myth. Here is the, the place of myth, and here is the place of history. So for example, each of the natural religions has a myth. In the case of the Incas, they believe that humanity started when Manco Capac and Mama Okio came out of the Lake Titicaca. Right? That's not history, that's myth. So how are they going to celebrate something in history if they don't have the notion of history? So what they, but they have their own form of cult. So what's their own form of cult? 
Ratzinger explains and he says, it's a sort of partnership with the gods, right? He says, we offer our worship to the gods and the gods sustain creation and, and reality. That's the way that natural religions work. We offer something to the gods so that gods can sustain the cosmos. Right? Certainly each natural religion has its own variants, but the constant equation is we offer something to the gods and the gods sustain creation. Do you remember reading about this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ratzinger says something very interesting. He says, though, though this form of worship is incomplete, there are some intuitions that are right. Tim Paul, do you remember what intuition does Ratzinger celebrate or does he rescue from the way that cosmic religions understand worship? Well, not sure. I do remember him talking about uh, the giving of gifts to God in our sacrifice of lands. He says that the right intuition of the cosmic religions is that man is made for worship. Right? Because if there's no worship, then there's no reality, because the gods won't sustain reality. So he says, in the natural religions, there is a right intuition, and the right intuition is men or man is made for worship. And he says not only that man is made for worship, but also that when he worships, he benefits humanity. Okay, I'm going to test you on this. Who can connect this with what we read in chapter 1? How is it? That when man worships, according to chapter 1, we truly benefit humanity itself. Do you remember the relationship that Ratzinger drew about worship, ethics, and law? So you see what he's, like, what's he's saying? He's saying there is the right intuition because when you, because in this vision, man is made for worship, but also when he worships, he serves the whole of creation. Okay, so this is natural religion and, it, and its worship is related with the cosmos. Okay, Walter Matthews, question for you. So does this mean that the worship of the church has nothing to do with creation? Because if you look at this diagram, or at this, this division, natural religion has to do with cosmos, Christianity, Ju Judaism has to do with history. Does this mean that in no way is our worship related with creation? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it does not mean that. <laughs> okay. So... That's <laughs> right. <laughs> So then Rassiger starts speaking about how is it, so this is the big question of the chapter. How is it then that the Christian worship incorporates or is related with creation itself? Right? So understand this. The main aspect of our worship is historical. We remember what God has done for us. We celebrate his 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 salvation for us in history and in time that still benefits us. But this does not mean that we're not unrelated with creation. So this is what he's going to do. He's going to start looking at He's going to start looking at the narration of creation in chapter 1 of Genesis, right? And God created the world in 7 days. Mr. Cook, question. In the narration of the creation, is cult explicitly mentioned? Is worship explicitly mentioned? Yes or no? No. Yes. No. 
You're right. <laughs> so this is what happens in the creation story, right? God creates in seven days, and in the last day, the Sabbath, he rests. So this is the point that Rassiger makes. He says, the whole creation story has in its zenith, like the whole culmination of the, of the story of creation is the Sabbath. The whole, the whole story is oriented towards the Sabbath. So the point he makes, and this is a beautiful point, is this shows us that creation is made for the covenant. So this means that the only reason why God has created this world is to draw a covenant with us. It's not that creation exists in itself, by itself, on its own terms, and then God says, well, well if it's already there, I should do a covenant. No, it's that everything was created for the covenant. So here you can see that creation and redemption are two concepts powerfully interrelated. It's not that first comes creation and later comes redemption or salvation history. It means that creation and history are all bound together. Because the whole point of the creation story is to finish in the Sabbath, in the day of the rest, in the day where man can rest and become equal to God, where all of the relationships between humans are subordinated and everybody is equal before God. Okay, but then the question is, Father, but now you're teaching me that creation is related with the covenant, but not how worship is related with creation. Who remembers what the point of Ratzinger your makes? The, the source of the creation story, the source of Judeo, well, Judeo law, is the same, and that when Moses is given the law seven times, um, or when he's constructing the temple, I suppose, seven times, it says Moses did as the Lord had commanded him, which he draws as a parallel to creation, and that it's, it's working towards worship on the same. Okay, so he's making a point, and he says, there is a symmetry between the story of creation and the story of the creation of the temple. So he says it's perfectly symmetrical, right? So you can see that, in a sense, the whole of creation is like a big temple offered to God. But he makes a different point too. Who remembers? Zach. Worship is the space where God and men meet. Who makes that point? Okay, that's true. But he says something different about the covenant, about what's the response that man can offer to the covenant. Who remembers? Okay, Zach? I'm trying to remember. I, I, feel, like, I feel like I'm almost synthesizing it, but I'm not quite. But I feel like the cup. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he says that. Uh, a man's response to the God who is good to him uh, is love, and the loving God means worshiping him. Yes! What page is it? It is 40, about uh, three quarters of the way there. So listen to this, guys. Even though the story of creation does not include the word worship, covenant already implies worship. Because covenant is God giving himself generously to man and the only response that man has to God's generosity that makes the covenant come into being is worship so that's why in the story of creation itself although it only it only apparently uh, takes us towards the Sabbath the Sabbath and the covenant already imply that man has to correspond God with his worship 
So I was thinking, how can we bring this to our life? What relationship can we draw to our life? And I was thinking about this. Maybe I'm forcing this a little bit, but maybe it can be used for you guys. So he's saying, the only response that man can give to the covenant is his praise and worship. And the covenant is really only fulfilled when man responds with praise and worship. So I just asked myself this question. Wouldn't it be true that the more we feel saved, the more we value what God has done for us, the greater we will feel gravitating towards our desire to praise Him, like the greater our understanding of us being saved, the greater we can see God's work for us, the more naturally it will result for us that we want to give Him back that response of praise and worship. So what does that, what does this look for me? This, this is my question. How much time of our day do we offer back to the Lord in praise and worship for the fact that we've been saved? How much of our day is offered to praise Him, to recognize His covenant, to recognize His gift for us? The gift of being saved, the gift of being baptized, the gift of being divinized. So I saw this and I thought it was, this was interesting. I saw Father Mike Schmitz making this encouragement. He said, and I think his encouragement is right. He said, people should choose to do Liturgy of the Hours at least once a day. Because I think the Liturgy of the Hours is participating in the worship that the church offers the Father himself. And it would make sense to me that the more we are understanding that we have been saved, the more we will be prompted to offer this, this worship. And he says, and I echo what he says, he says, the easiest place to start is night prayer. Because it's the shortest, it always repeats itself every day of the week. It's a, it's a small place where to start. I think I've, I've shared with you this before, but we priests, we have to do five hours a day. And it's beautiful because it fills your whole day with praise and worship. You look, and, and I think it becomes more meaningful when you pray, you recognize that you are celebrating the mystery of Christ's death and salvation for you. So, you're, so yeah, I, that's the point I'm trying to make. If we are to live the covenant, our natural response is praise and worship. How deeply has the mystery of the passion of Christ penetrated in our lives that conducts us naturally to include praise and worship in our day? So, if we want to bring it down to earth, men, consider praying with the Judeals. I've heard that it's beautiful for spouses to do night prayer together. It's really low key, five minutes. You get to pray together with the Psalms. You get to worship together. You get to recognize with your family that you've been saved, that you have participated in the covenant, that your only response is praise and worship. So that's a challenge, consideration, thought you should consider. We'll do one more. Is that all the first one still? <laughs> <laughs> it's very dense, the chapter. I'm going to do only one more. Like six threads in this chapter. One more, really quick. So, I think it's very interesting. So, once he finishes this point of how the covenant naturally impels us to respond with love and worship, he says, what is sacrifice? He makes that big question, right? So, so what is the sacrifice that we can offer? Okay, so he says, the word sacrifice is 
embedded with a lot of misunderstandings. Do you remember any of the what's the typical misunderstanding with the word sacrifice? Destruction. Destruction. Destruction to give. Yeah. Destruction of what? Something good. Yeah. yeah. Destruction of something valuable. Yeah. What? Yeah. Something worthy. Because the destruction of something worthy is, in a way, a declaration of, the, of God's sovereignty. Like, this is only for him. But then Ratzinger asks this question. Is it really pleasing for God, the destruction of something? He says, of course not. Of course not. So he says, let's look at the understanding that the church fathers have of the concept of sacrifice. El Eric, by any chance, do you remember what was the understanding of the church fathers of, the, of sacrifice? It's not destruction. What is it then? Is it offering up? Yes. Do you want to refine your <coughs> response? <laughs> <laughs> Giving it to God. You're on to something. Do you remember, Jared? Isn't it like a way of being? Yes. He says it's a way of being. What sort of way of being? Um, one that follows the will of God for the whole of creation. Okay, so, so he says it's moving away from a way of being, away from independence and alterchy and autonomy from God, right? He says a way of being where everything is reconnected with God, where everything is offered back to God, that everything is divinized. And then he goes to Mentioned explicitly a church father, St. Augustine, right? And he says that the true sacrifice is the Chivitas Day. Who remembers specifically what he says about the Chivitas Day? He says the offering of whole humanity and of all creation to God is an act of love. Right? So that's the true sacrifice. And I was thinking, how can we relate this to our life? But first, how can we connect this to the first chapter? The connection is obvious. Who can draw it? You can just make up how you worship. <laughs> no. I mean, the first chapter we were saying that the true way of worship is your life offered to God, right? Right. Live according to the command. But it seems to me that now we're specifying even more how is it that our life truly glorifies God. And it seems to me that our, li our life truly glorifies God when everything that happens in our life is offered up to him. So this is my prompting, and this with and with this I end. I guess this concept of sacrifice could make us consider this question: How many things in my life are apart from God? Like, is it true that I've made everything in my life offered up in sacrifice? Like, is it true that everything in my life? Comes, a, comes apart from a way of existence that it's apart from God and it's truly everything, let's say, reconciled with God. And I'm saying this because sometimes we have our spiritual life, but we have our entertainment apart from God. We have aspects of our life that are not, not, that are not truly offered a sacrifice to God. Is it true that every single aspect of our life, every moment, every hour, every desire that we have in our hearts, it, has everything truly been sacrificed to Him? Or are there aspects that there's still certain autonomy? Like, from here, God doesn't come into my life. But what truly, and I think, and I think, that this is a place where we can see why is it that with baptism we have become a priestly people. Because as priests, all by baptism, we are meant to make everything an offering to God. Right? We are meant to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. But the question is, what are we keeping from making a sacrifice to God? What is it in your life that you are keeping from sacrificing? That cannot truly be offered to God. Because you still keep it in a sense of like autonomy, apart from God. Okay? So, that's it for today. So remember, natural religions, a cosmic worship. Christianity, Judaism, 
a historic worship. But this does not mean that our worship is not cosmic in a way. And we saw this because in the story of creation, everything ends up in a covenant. Right? So creation is made for the covenant. And the only way in which human beings can respond to a covenant is with an answer of love and worship. So that's why we understand that creation has been made for worship. Because creation has, made, has, has been made for the covenant. Okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's take one minute and then we do the discussion. <laughs>